Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, would you please take your seats? Well, dear friends, uh, very welcome to this 2009 John W. Holmes Memorial Lecture. Um, traveling, as we all know, affects us in various ways. For one thing, our names may change when we shift places. For instance, uh, back in Sweden, I'm Christo Jönsson. When I cross the Atlantic, inevitably I become Chris Johnson. Uh, had today's speaker been living in Europe, he would have been Thomas Weiss. And we all know him as Tom Wies. Well, Tom requires very little introduction. Few persons, if any, embody Aikens the way Tom does. He was executive director of Aikens between 1992 and 1998. He's been co-editor of Global Governance between 2001 and 2005. He's serving as chair of Aikens since 2006 until this meeting in 2009. He's been co-director of the UN Intellectual History Project and co-editor of the Oxford Handbook on the United Nations, which was launched at the Aikens Annual Meeting in New York in 2007. Tom, as you know, is author, co-author, editor, co-editor of two numerous books to be mentioned and articles and a textbook, which I understand is now uh, coming out in its uh, much-used textbook, which is coming out in its sixth edition. It's written on such hot topics on the UN agenda as humanitarian intervention, responsibility to protect, and terrorism. I won't even try to start listing or exemplifying all his, uh, uh, his wide publication record Instead, I want to go back to his very first book, International Bureaucracy, published in 1975, uh, right after he has, had gotten his PhD from Princeton the year before. It's a book that I happen to have in my bookshelf. Um, and I looked at it. Uh, it's, it's uh, before going here, uh, it's uh, about, uh, ILO and UNICEF, and the working hypothesis on the, one of the first pages goes like this, and I quote, the unwieldy administrative structure of functional secretariats are counterproductive to the idealistic goals that they have been created to pursue. And I also noted the very, f the final sentence of the book, and again I quote, it may prove to be one of the great ironies of history that the hope for the future survival of pragmatism lies in utopian ideas, ideals. And I think this final sentence in the first book catches Tom's approach ever since very well. On the one hand, there's this pragmatism, policy relevance, he has served at uh, UNCTAD, UNITAR, ILO, and other organizations. He is consultant for foundations, IGOs, and NGOs. He is, in short, part of what he himself has described as the third UN. And it's also typical that his latest book is labeled What's Wrong with the United Nations and How to Fix It. On the other hand, the ideals upon which the UN system is built have always been the compass for Tom as researcher and practitioner. Tom is now leaving as chair of Aikens, but as Shakespeare wrote in one of his plays, every exit is an entrance somewhere else. 
And in Tom's case, he has entered as president of the International Studies Association, ISA. And uh, also typical of Tom is that he had his inaugurating address with a build topic, what happened to the idea of world government? Well, today Tom returns to the subject area of his first book. And today he's going to talk about reinvigorating the international civil service. Please welcome Tom Wies. I deserve a raise, Krister. I'm going to have you write a letter to the provost. Um, thanks, really, for those excessively kind words of introduction. Um, I'm never quite sure how one of my two irreverent daughters would conduct the same uh, introduction, actually. Uh, several years ago, I was, it wasn't an Aikens meeting, but I was leaving for some place, forgotten some piece of paper, ran back upstairs. And I heard one of them saying, you know, I haven't a clue what he does. I haven't a clue why anyone would pay him to say anything. I would pay him to keep quiet. So we'll, we'll see. It's, it's a pleasure to join so many friends, colleagues, mentors who've given this talk in the past. I think it's a testament, Patty, to the quality of the, the network if you just le read the people who are on the back of the brochure. So it's an honor to give this 20th, I think 20th, um, Holmes lecture named in honor of a distinguished Canadian diplomat who died before he could get to his first, uh, or just after the first Aikens meeting. Um, and uh, Trinidadians, if they haven't already, will discover why so many of us devote a considerable portion of our professional uh, energy to this institution, of which we're not only proud, but kind of fond. Well, Christer, thanks for citing those two books. It was actually the reason why I chose this topic. I thought when you get increasingly long in the tooth, it's time to go back and to come forward. Uh, it's also to demonstrate that I have no long-term or short-term memory loss. Um, I'm going to try to also mix in some insights from the Intellectual History Project, which um, was actually launched uh, with my colleagues Louis Emery and Richard Jolly after Jolly's Holmes Lecture in 1996. And the first book, of course, was done uh, under the supervision of Lee Gordanker, who gave the first Holmes Lecture in 1990. I'm going to start by doing something we teach our students not to do, quote my colleagues and myself. The last sentence in, that, in the first book of the History Project says, people matter. Why this emphasis? It seems to me that I believe, after all these years, that there are creative contributions by individuals who work at the UN, whereas most of the time, most analysts stress the politics of the 192 member states that make it impossible, so-called, for the bloated bureaucracy to do anything. My proposition is different and fairly straightforward. The World Organization should rediscover some of the idealistic roots of the International Civil Service to make more room for creative idea mongers, as well as establish a more mobile personnel and career development path for the 21st century secretariat. I'm going to briefly try to do four things. Look at the origins of the concept, the problems that have developed, the logic of why I think reform makes sense, and then a couple of specific illustrations of things that have happened. I'm going to pull examples from peace and security, human rights, and uh, sustainable development. OK, so let me begin. What is this overwhelming bureaucracy, which has underwhelming leadership at times? I'm going to focus, as Chris just said, I've been concerned more recently with the third UN. And obviously, uh, Innes Claude long ago taught us we should look at the first UN, the member states. And the second UN, the people who were paid by it, the International Civil Service. And it's that chunk, the second UN, that I'm going to look at today. It, the Carnegie Endowment during the middle of World War II called the League of Nations the great experiment. And the great experiment of having an international civil service found its way into 
Charter Article 101, which calls for securing the highest standards of efficiency, competence, and integrity. Well, the UN's second um, Secretary General, Dag Hammarskjöld, was the most notable spokesman for this concept. And his speech at Oxford shortly before his death in 1961 is frequently cited. There's a wonderful passage in the middle of it in which he spells out, and I quote, that any erosion or abandonment of the international civil service might, if accepted by member nations, well prove to be the Munich of international cooperation. Hammerschel fervently believed that officials could go beyond national interest to find a common good symbolized by the light-colored blue passport, which was distinct from the narrow interests of the countries that issued their national passports. Well, obviously, setting aside senior positions or junior positions for officials who are approved by their home countries belies that integrity. Governments seek to ensure that their own interests are defended within secretariats. Several of them, even in the past and at current, rely on officials for intelligence. From the outset, for example, the fact that the five permanent members got to name, select, and place in jobs, nationals to fill posts in, this, in the uh, cabinet illustrates that fact. And then during the 1950s and 60s, decolonization, 100 new states, they all clamored for their quota, their share of the booty. Um, the result, frankly, has been downplaying competence and exaggerating national origins as the main criterion for recruitment and promotion. Over the years, efforts to improve gender balance and age discrimination have led to other kinds of quotas. Virtually all positions above the director level, and sometimes way below, are vetted and the object of active campaigns by government, including, of course, the already rewarded permanent five. Well, how many people am I talking about? There were 500 at Lake that first year after Lake Success. Today, there are 55,000 in the UN proper and the agencies created by the GA, another 20,000 in specialized agencies, probably 120,000 this year in peacekeeping operations, another 15,000 in the Bretton Woods institutions. So there's been a huge increase, but obviously not very much in relationship to the nature of the problems that we face. Well, why do I emphasize this topic? Because for me, actually, and this, I think you're correct, Christopher, I haven't lost this notion of agencies, that individuals matter for both good and for ill. The second UN does, in my view, or could in many ways, carry, not carry out marching orders from governments. And here I disagree, actually, with a sentence Roger that I found. And Roger gave this lecture last year, Roger Cote, Don Puchala in 1995. And in a, in a book they recently wrote, they, curi they dismissed the notion that the United Nations is an autonomous actor in world affairs that can and does take action independent of the will and wishes of member governments. Of course, this is true for resolutions and political decisions, but it's not true for much of what goes on. UN officials present ideas, tackle problems, debate them informally and formally with governments, take initiatives, advocate for change, turn decisions into programs, implement experiments in the field. They monitor progress, report to national officials and politicians, give particular spins to issues. I think that there's considerably more room for creativity and initiative than we commonly think. I don't think any of this should surprise us. It would be a strange and impotent national civil service that took no initiative, showed no leadership, simply awaited instructions from on top. In my view, UN officials sometimes are no different, and they should be no different on most occasions. Well, this brings me to the problems. What's happened? I think any way you cut this, whether it's recruitment, composition, rewards, retention, performance, international civil servants are now part of what ails the organization. Many of us in this room, Brian Urquhart, for example, have concentrated on what do we do to change the election process for the secretaries general, heads of agencies. But for me, the problems go much deeper. The, and the quality and the work of the secretariats 
are something that we can do something about, or a secretary general. Leakage, so-called, to Jordan and Turkey are one thing. But that's not what interests me. What interests me here is the sloppy management of this politically visible and crucial assignment that was so botched that tarnished the organization's reputation. So while Volcker and the, the press pay attention to the ethically improper uh, activities, including by Anand Sankojo, what I find most disconcerting is the inattentive management system that was outmoded, inept, and quite out of its depth in administering a program of this size and complexity. Quite simply, they didn't have the technology or the people to do a good job. Or let's look at women in the organization. The pace of change has been, in my view, nothing short of glacial. At the beginning of the 21st century, they are ex not excluded, but minimalized in both the trenches and the bureaucracy. The beginning of this year, of the troops that are in UN operations, not quite 2% uh, consist of women. If you look at the Secretariat as a whole, about a third, including the general service categories, are uh, women. It's only at the entry level, the P1 level, that there is anything approaching something like gender balance. And in the higher categories and above, women are less than a quarter. And at the, the area where it would be easiest to do something, namely the, the uh, naming of special representative, beginning this year, two of 26 were women. Well, is the human rights arena any different? And for me, the human rights arena would be the one where the UN should shine. The UN is the set standards and therefore the standard bearer uh, should be implementing the, or leading the implementation of the standards that it sets. You don't have to look much beyond the, um, the trading money for food and sex in a whole series of peacekeeping operations. There have been some studies, there have been some efforts, but, for, and the Secretary General supposedly implemented a zero tolerance policy but the boys will be boys, because they mainly are, um, continues. Second, uh, for me, what's even more disconcerting is the lack of support for people at the top who run risks and stick out their necks. They're caught at this vortex of sovereignty and human rights. So if you look closely at Jan Pronk, who appeared, who is the gave the keynote at our meeting in The Hague a number of years ago. Jan Pronk um, was the special rep watching the slow motion uh, genocide in Darfur. In then as now, governments are dragging their feet. He chose to speak out and he chose to put some statements on his own personal blog. The government made him persona non grata and his reward was the Secretary General calling him home before even the government had thrown him out. Now, once again, I don't think this should imply that there haven't been numerous examples of people, including a couple in this room, who haven't acted differently. But what I think is peculiar is the weight of the shackles of political correctness that circumscribes activities in the human rights arena. This is a major shortcoming. Well, what about sustainable development? And I, the thing is, I've got lots of stories. These are, I'm not cherry-picking examples. The most recent and egregious one was the Secretary General's naming the new head of the Department of Economic and Social Affairs. The choice was a Chinese diplomat who had started out life as a translator and has no exposure, previous exposure to development thinking and practice. This is not atypical. The, the deputy who actually was at a naked meeting as well, uh, was chosen for no other reason, frankly, than she's a Tanzanian Muslim woman. This is not exceptional. The UK and US uh, undersecretaries general were chosen because uh, they may be trained diplomats. They had no knowledge of what they were working on, but they were close to George Bush and Tony Blair when they were, they were nominated. Again, I don't think it's fair to say that there haven't been intellectual stalwarts Raul Prebish, Havili Sapila, or Robert Jackson and Joan Anstey on the, uh, on the operational side. The selection criteria for senior appointments, in my view, has increasingly been based on nationality rather than an experienced track record and an ability to do the job. 
Now, perhaps we shouldn't be surprised, but it doesn't strike me that these positions should provide on-the-job training, that political considerations should not trump competence. So why, why do I think this is important? Well, 90% of the world organization's expenditures are for its employees. Therefore, if you wanted to do something to reinvigorate the institution, in my view, you could actually do this. Perhaps not quickly, but you could do it. So this will, uh, I do not agree with Susan Strange and Robert Cox, who gave this talk in 1992, who would argue that the views from the inside of a secretariat can only be orthodox, can only sustain the status quo of the, of the current order. I really have a different view. It seems to me that the, this international service, properly constituted, can and could make a difference. It seems to me that the examples that one could pull out of ignoring standard bureaucratic operating procedures, you have to be willing to run risk, you have to make waves. I think the best historical example was um, actually a very short-term assignment by his former U.S. Congressman Brad Morris, who became the, uh, the uh, UNDP administrator, and Maurice Strong, who headed up something called the uh, Office of Emergency Operations in Africa in the mid-1970s. Quickly, they put this together virtually overnight. They broke all the rules for recruitment. They broke all the rules for relating to governments and it moved ahead. It seems to me that if you look back to the career of somebody like Sir Robert Jackson, the same kinds of things he did in the Mediterranean during the Second World War as a uh, naval logistics guy, he then put in UNRWA and in the Bangladesh emergency. Now, the high-level panel on threats, challenges, and change, among the other mice that they hatched, was a look at the civil service. And their proposal, which reiterates proposals made over time, was a one-time buyout to get rid of Deadwood. Well, nothing is happening on this proposal, but I don't think the proposal ad addresses the problem. Frankly, if you had a buyout, the good people would leave because they have options. The real Deadwood would stay because they couldn't go anything else. So my proposition relates to how do you gather new wood, not how do you get the best, brightest, youngest folks hired and promoted and then out of the organization. So my proposal here is to go back to, as I said, the idealistic origins, the theory that was devote, developed during the League of Nations. Competence should be the highest consideration, not geographical origins, not gender, not age, and every other cr rationale that comes up for cronyism within recruitment offices. At a minimum, the take it or leave it approach for, for the senior post, which are reserved for particular nationalities, has to change so that one would name three or four or five candidates and the choice would then be left to the secretariat. That would be an interim step. I think as in domestic situations, it's a fallacy to argue that quality must suffer while we're trying to get a qualified and diverse secretariat. Lots of recruitment efforts can be made, including having standardized exams, which are not, not standardized, they change per region and country. Um, to, the real requirement here is try to limit influence and patronage from governments, north, south, east, west, and every way you cut it. The beginning of a term for a secretary general is usually a good time to at least make some changes. Annan did this in 97 and again in 2002, just as Boutros did it in 1992. The current Secretary General made no such effort, which is not surprising. Um, and moreover, the clash, the futile clash between South and North at the end of Annan's term stalled consideration of sensible proposals to place more budgetary authority on the 38th floor. A relatively small number of countries said, oh, we don't want decision-making to move to the Secretariat. This is going to be somehow manipulated by the North. It has to be uh, left in the GA. In fact, Mark Malik Brown, when he gave this lecture in 1997, said, and I'm going to quote, taking a demotion to come over from UNDP to be Annan's chief of staff was a much bigger step down than I anticipated. I found when it came to management and budgetary matters, he was less influential than I had been. So if the UN is going to move ahead, it needs better personnel and it needs more responsibility at the top to determine uh, 
what goes well. Let me just pick up a few examples of things that have mo moved ahead modestly, once again, from these three areas. On, and the problems I discussed earlier of uh, sexual misconduct, uh, the best that's happened is that Prince Zaid actually came out with a pretty hard-hitting report. Once again, not much has happened. But what needs in this kind of arena for discipline to happen is that the U it has to be a, a kind of international UN discipline. Troops are still only responsible to their national authorities. So if anything happens, they may be sent back home. They may be left where they are. So not much has happened there. I mentioned very little on the gender front. In fact, certain member countries are far ahead of the UN in any way you measure it. Um, uh, for instance, Liberia, after Ellen Johnson Sirleaf was elected the first woman head of state in Africa, she's now named in no particular order ministers of defense, women, who, ministers of defense, finance, sports, youth, justice, commerce, chief of police, president of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It seems to me that the UN has a lot of catching up to do in relationships of some governments in this respect. I think in the human rights arena, there have been more examples uh, of what might happen. Um, my thoughts here revolve around using more outsiders, insisting upon an obligatory field rotation, and issuing fewer permanent contracts to people who work in this arena. As I look at the human rights arena, uh, the, the tendency to avoid any kind of confrontation, not not even robust, but even a gentle variety is often shied away from. One of the solutions, and I, I was actually speaking to a couple of people earlier today about this, the one that I've analyzed in some depth involves work on internally displaced persons by Francis Deng and Roberta Cohen. Um, because Deng was not inside the UN, he had a blue hat when he wanted it, but he was mainly outside. He was mainly working at the Brookings Institution. My own evaluation of, of his both legal and conceptual s steps forward around the notion of state sovereignty and internally displaced persons and the whole launching of the responsibility to protect bait reflects the fact that he, was, he had a foot in two camps. He was inside when he wanted to be inside, but he was outside most of the time. He had soft money. Uh, and his base at a public policy think tank and working in tandem with academics provided uh, a respectable distance from governments and the kind of political pressure that he comes under now, that he's totally in the UN as the special advisor on genocide, he has his, his sort of room for maneuver is totally circumscribed and he is, uh, in my view, uh, much quieter than he needs to be. Moreover, because he raised money that was not, it, some of it was from governments, but these governments or foundations expected uh, for him and his team to push out what passes for conventional wisdom and not accept the usual diplomatic pablum. So it seems to me this role of outside insider or inside outsider offers real advantages that should be replicated for other issues when independent research uh, instant, where their independent research is required, institutional barriers are high, normative exas, uh, gaps exist, and political hostility is widespread. Second, it seems to me that one of the uh, largest sources of internal morale being low revolves around the fact that promotions are really based on um, your contacts in headquarters, your performance in headquarters when the work is really in the field. UNHCR in 1982 um, implemented the first obligatory rotation policy. Uh, this was emphasized as critically important, so all except a few top administrators have to go to the field. The Joint Inspection Unit has cited this. Subsequently, both UNDP and UNICEF have approached, not quite reached, UNACR's ability to turn people over. It seems to me that this creates a sense of equity and knowledge 
It also leads to high divorce rates, but this is exactly the kind of thing that needs to happen. As Annan was leaving office, he, he said the thing that had to happen most Free, and most urgently uh, was a radical overhaul of the United Nations Secretariats, its rules, its structure, its systems, and its culture, indeed. The League of Nations instituted permanent contracts, a practice that was continued by the UN, uh, supposedly to protect staff from government pressure and arbitrary dismissal. These are the same kinds of arguments that are made in the academy about university tenure, and in fact the critics argue in exactly the same way, I being one of them, that removing the possibility of being let go or moving on leads to more coasting rather than more productivity. Well, one of the things that happened during Annan's tenure was that the number of permanent contracts were increasingly phased out. Now, I realize there may be problems uh, with institutional memory, you need certain kinds of administrators here and there, but it seems to me that, that permanent or continuing contracts should be minimized, particularly for serious substantive jobs. And within the human rights arena, for example, I think the argument could be made that virtually no one should have a long contract, should make a, a, a mark and get out. In fact, if a staff member were doing his or her job, governments would be wanting his or her head. Finally, let me look at the sustainable development arena for a couple of examples. It seems to me that what's really required is better intellectual firepower and younger people. Ideas are frankly like period P people, to t take my earlier refrain, they matter for good and for ill. So we all are familiar with Keynes's remark that men and women who don't have time to read are often uh, led and, and uh, taking action on the basis of theories from dead scribblers or live ones like those in this room. Um, it seems to me that the role of powerful minds are really essential. We look to people like Hans Singer, I already mentioned Raoul Prebisch, the Caribbean's own Arthur Lewis, eight other Nobel laureates in economics. A contemporary example would be uh, Mahmoud al Haq the Pakistani economist who launched the Human Development Report, obviously uh, calling a spade a shovel in numerical terms does not always make friends or fans among governments. There was an enormous pressure that UNDP should not continue with this. They insisted that it maintain its independence. And lo and behold, by saying, following our, my favorite political scientist, Nancy Reagan, by just saying no, governments backed off. UNDP has continued um, to bring this report out. It continues to embarrass certain governments, rich and poor. It seems to me that at every level of the organization, there needs to be better leadership. And it seems to me that this is much more likely to come from people on short or fixed term contracts, specialized consultants and academics on leave, rather than from permanent civil servants whose careers are dependent upon reactions from superiors and governments, and who don't stay abreast of what's going on in the analytical or academic world. So it seems to me that the first step is to admit that this is one of the major activities, one of the major comparative advantages, and to hire people for brief terms and allow them to make their contribution. The second is that donor governments obviously have to put up with the uh, notion that, that research and ideas and monitoring actually make a difference. The second part of this would involve, and obviously there are no silver bullets here either, but lowering the average age. It's hard to believe that the entry level average age in the UN, a P1, is 37 years old. The average age of the Secretariat as a whole is over 46. So there's a real opportunity in the next five years, I talked to the head of personnel, when about 15% of staff reach retirement age. Well, Adelaide Stevenson once joked that the work at the UN involves protocol and geritol and alcohol. Um, and it seems to me that relatively little can be done about diplomatic procedures or the consumption of uh, fermented beverages, either in New York or here. But it seems to me that sclerosis is a guarantee of mediocrity and have to find ways to getting younger people in. So, yeah, let me, let me terminate here. Um, 
it doesn't seem to me that obviously I can't argue that the International Civil Service is the uh, the most raging UN illness. We've got uh, other candidates for that, including uh, notions of national sovereignty and uh, vacuous uh, north-south debate. But it seems to me that the health of the second U UN is something that can be changed and therefore should be changed. Uh, indeed, the UN's, in spite of all the warts, its residual legitimacy keeps a surprisingly large number of competent people committed to its work. At the end of Annan's term, uh, he, uh, I mentioned his quote about investing in the United Nations, and interestingly, the so-called Four Nations Initiative, Chile, South Africa, Sweden, and Thailand, put together a think group to try to pull together what it would mean to uh, give meat to his recommendations. And they started off with the usual mantra of geographical representation, but I think that was for public consumption. They set that aside, and they actually moved to make several, several specific proposals about merit-based recruitment and promotion, short-term contracts, expert hearings for the most senior appointments. In short, they were seeking a way to reinvigorate the International Civil Service, which is why I think the next Secretary General may take this on. I'm going to stop there. Thank you. How, we can, how many minutes do we have? Please. I, I can't see, so just, and if you've got a mic, that would help. Um, well, let me try both of those. The notion that, that a geographic uh, background is one indication of diversity is, is just fine with me. The problem is that these quotas are rigid. And, uh, you know, if, you, if you're exactly the right person from the Netherlands, uh, you know, tant pis, you can't apply for these posts because there has to be somebody from an underrepresented place. It seems to me that, that, that this is remarkably akin to kind of affirmative action by in the, in the United States in particular, that you have to move beyond a single notion of what it is, uh, particularly in a, in a world in which, you know, if you're a Sudanese with a U.S. passport in, uh, in Chicago, it is, they, you know, what are you? Uh, or a new board member, Ramesh Thakur, who doesn't have an Indian passport, and that's what he is, but he's got four other passports. I mean, what does it mean, you know, what, should I get to use my, uh, this passport? So, it seems to me that this should be one notion, but certainly not the only one. Um, no, I'm the last person to talk about more being better. Um, I mean, one of the, the, the crucial problems is that you can't get rid of anything that's been started. I mean, the trusteeship council being the, most, the silliest example, but there. Um, but that's that's kind of a, a different topic. So I I don't necessarily I I do think that in many areas of work the UN needs far more people. Certainly not all areas, um, but rearranging these folks is, is is actually I think a slightly different talk, a different part of a different book actually. Yes. 
Th thanks for an excellent uh, lecture. I I've just got one question about this human rights sovereignty conflict. And you, you said um, the shackles, the, talked about the shackles of political correctness that circumscribe action in the human rights arena. Um, and I, something that often comes to my mind when I think about this is in 2001, before the Iraq War, when Tony Blair gave his Chicago lecture, um, he outlined, actually, whatever we think of him more broadly, quite a coherent argument and quite an intellectually driven argument for some of the other arguments Tony Blair made um, <laughs> at that time. And I just wondered if you could comment on, perhaps, either speculate on what would have happened had Iraq not happened, whether that might have gained more purchase within the UN, or how we could perhaps go about resurrecting some of those ideas now. Maybe you should explain to people, this, this was a lecture on... On humanitarian. Yeah, on uh, liberal, liberal interventionism, really. It was a, a forceful statement of what it can achieve. No, and I, that's, well, that was, the, the problem with humanitarian intervention is, is that it's politically incorrect to start out with. Uh, and making that argument uh, to a developed country audience in Chicago after uh, both he and, uh, you know, after WMDs were no longer in the play and at, that had been exposed as empty and, oh, by the way, there weren't on any links to Al-Qaeda, oh, well, we've got this humanitarian stuff. In fact, uh, the, that almost became a conversation stopper for the entire notion of, of humanitarian intervention because it morphed into, I mean, the, the clearly that was, had nothing to do it might have been a good argument in 1989 in Halabja or something, but it certainly was not an argument in 2003 after everything else had been exposed. So this kind of, uh, as I say, what passes for political correctness, I actually think it was a good speech. It was just, you know, the t not, timing wasn't exactly perfect on that one. Um, and uh, I think ultimately on that topic, we're going to come back to it, uh, then that being the ultimate example of human rights, obviously. Okay, I have, I have the microphone. Tom, I have the microphone. You have the microphone, Bertie. Okay. Now, why is it taking you all this time to ask a question for Christ's sake? Tom, I want to say the following to you. This is the Academic Council for the United Nations System. And the idea of this whole enterprise, and the idea of your lecture, is to deepen thinking about the issues that we're interested in. And in the spirit, I appreciate your lecture. But I want to say to you that three things should feature in the printed version of your lecture. And leadership, politics, and diplomacy. So let me start with politics first. <laughs> International organizations are political institutions. And so the leadership of these organizations have to swim in political seas. So, that's, so therefore, uh, as, a question, as an issue of analysis, I want to say to you, focusing on the minutiae of the international civil service is not where the analysis should be. That's the first point. Then leadership. You have edited, you're a co-editor of the Intellectual History Project series, which has as its rationale the identification of the, of the contribution of the United Nations to ideas. Mm -hmm. And so now the question is, it is important to us, is the contemporary leadership of the United Nations or the system, is it making a contribution to political ideas? And I know your views on some of these issues, but I want to say to you that someone like Secretary Jean Ban Ki-moon in his own style is providing important leadership on the issues of climate change, uh, water shortage, the international financial crisis. So where does leadership fo uh, feature into this? Um, the right area which you mentioned, the developing countries that control the United Nations are determined that in this era they will not be put into the dock at the United Nations. And so they have the vote. And so now whoever is leading these programs has to find a way to navigate these shark infested waters. So I want to say to you that uh, no, maybe you shouldn't revise this lecture. Well, <laughs> You deliver it again. Factor these three things. See, and thank you for the there. Well, besides that, Mrs. Lincoln, what else did you like about this? Um, the, the, um, 
I mean, we obviously disagree on Ban Ki Moon. Um, uh, I think he has been, in fact, I, I, I just ran a series of workshops with UN officials in New York, sponsored by the Ebert Stift, and to figure out what they could come up with to say on the financial crisis, because clearly he's been totally absent. The UN has been out of the picture. In fact, the IMF was more or less out of the picture until recently, but the UN has been totally absent. So the fact that he would take a leadership role on anything, but certainly not financial stuff. Uh, that, that, well, okay. We, no, but he hasn't. He, well, anyway, okay. Okay. But he, I mean, you're going to have to persuade about 50 people who have been sitting through this all spring who are at the UN in New York that he's done something. Oh, well, okay. Okay. Well, if that, I mean, if that's leadership, okay. Um, I don't think so. On the notion of um, obviously swimming in political seas, it depends on how you swim. I think for the most part we're treading water and getting farther away uh, from the danger. Um, I have always, in, in, I mean, I can. I think the best anecdote, I mean, governments, you have to say no to them. I think if it's secretary general and anybody else says no. I mean, one time on this issue, I mean, this is a relevant anecdote, so I'm going to diverge here for 40 seconds or maybe 45. I was recruiting somebody to work on least developed countries in French-speaking West Africa. I had, I found some guy in the back of a Jeep, a Dutchman who had lived there for 15 years. He applied for the job. There were 100 other people. Um, he actually was the best person there, PhD in economics from Utrecht or someplace. Anyway, uh, all of a sudden I get a call from the Secretary General's office. You haven't looked at the Sudanese candidate. I said, well, um, what do you mean the Sudanese candidate? Uh, he was a lawyer. He doesn't speak French. He knows nothing about West Africa. What do you mean? I looked at him seriously. Well, we're getting really serious pressure from the Sudanese mission. I said, you've got to be kidding. So what I did was I simply called up a friend at the Dutch mission and said, would you make one phone call to the Secretary General's office and say you're interested in this, this uh, Dutchman? And that was all it took. That was the end of the conversation. If you speak to people, it, I, I was just speaking to Sakiko Fukuda Para, the meeting we had in, in Uppsala uh, a couple of weeks ago, on reactions to the Human Development Report, because 20 years later, people are still reacting to it. She says what it usually takes is sort of taking the, you know, the, the uh, second secretary from the Egyptian mission in New York out to lunch or something, that much of what passes for huge pressures from governments, you need to just stand up to. And so we, we just have a difference in appreciation here of what it takes to stand up. Um, on yeah, on, on criminal prosecution, I, I, you know, I, I, we ought to talk about the ICC because, in fact, um, the uh, issuing this uh, warrant arrest to uh, El Bashir when no one was going to do anything um, uh, exposes the feebleness uh, of the system, and I think it's ultimately going to backfire. In fact, I would speculate that probably 15 African countries that had signed it are probably going to follow the Bush administration and unsign it. There's a, there's a movement in New York on that drag. So I, I don't disagree about how you, um, you know, when you need to be diplomatic and undiplomatic. I think in that case, it's mainly, you know, exposing the ICC emperor uh, with very few clothes on. Because if you're going to do these kinds of things, there has to be some follow-up. You can't issue a warrant with no expectation that anything's going to happen. I think that was the case. My question relates to introductory low, lowest level employment. And there <clears throat> we have the um, perennial conflict of geographic distribution versus merit. Well, I begin with the premise that intelligence and talent are more or less equally distributed around the world, but that opportunity is, has not been and therefore, what appears to be merit uh, is unequally distributed, 
because of opportunities that people have had to go to Princeton or Yale or Oxford or Cambridge or wherever. So <clears throat> the question is, if we followed your suggestion and had uh, really truly competitive entry exams which tested intelligence and aptitude, uh, might we then inc recruit people who show promise but have not had much experience that would make them competitive uh, if there were a level playing field, um, and, um, and then subject all new recruits, all new low uh, entry level requirement uh, uh, appointments to a year of in-house training <coughs> where they would be <coughs> subjected to a common administrative culture. And then <coughs> after that year, the difference, the disparity between people who have talent but have not yet acquired, it, acquired uh, much merit uh, would the disparity between them and the people who have had more opportunities uh, would be diminished and uh, one could weed out people who didn't come up to a certain standard and thereby improve the quality of the UN civil service. Actually, a good idea. Um, the uh, tr training in general is not a long uh, suit of the United Nations, nor is um, either mid-career or at the beginning of the career or the end of the career. Uh, I mean, Aikens at one time tried to start a, a sabbatical program, which then s sort of fell apart because people were worried about going back to jobs, etc. Uh, I was just speaking with Roland about, he was asking me about w what kind of uh, uh, sort of historical knowledge there are for new f officials. The answer is there's not much. You get explained the charter. There's really not a, an indoctrination so that people don't understand, you know, what happened at the founding of the organization, what was the context surrounding the NIEO and how the group of 77, they, they have no sense for where the organization's been, why it's been where it was, how it's developed to where it is. Um, so the, the, there would be a, a two-part argument, I think, for your, your training. One, to perhaps give people a chance and, and, and see whether, uh, you know, during this interim period, uh, which is supposedly part of what goes on now, but doesn't happen. Once you're there, it's virtually impossible to get rid of somebody, um, to implement that, but to mix it together with certain kinds of uh, training. I, good idea. No. What, you, hmm? You're going to cut me off? Okay, well, you can turn off my microphone. Maybe we can thank Professor Weiss with a round of applause. Tom, I'd like to thank you not only for a very eloquent and thoughtful Holmes lecture, but also for your service as chair over the last three years. As Krister mentioned, uh, Tom steps down this week while we're here in Trinidad, uh, and he will move into the position of past chair. And I just want to say what a pleasure it's been for us to work with you. I can certainly vouch for the fact that Tom approaches his work with great dedication, great integrity, and great humor. And not only have I learned a lot from working with you, but I've had a lot of fun. We wanted to give you a gift to mark the time that you've spent as chair. And I know you're going to kill me when you try to take it home because it is breakable. Can I drink it? No, you cannot. <laughs> <laughs> since the Holmes Lecture is named for a Canadian, and since you have overseen a secretariat that's been located in Canada, we wanted to give you something with a Canadian flavor. And what we chose for you is a glass sculpture by a Canadian artist, a sculpture of Nanookshuk. Now, the Canadians in the room know that a Nanookshuk uh, is something that we associate with the Inuit people. And for the Inuit people, when they go out to hunt, they typically erect small stone Inukshuks along their path because they know that the path uh, when they return home, will be covered over with snow. So in order to find their way, they can follow the little Inukshuks that they've built. And we thought that that was an apt symbol, because we know that you've guided the organization, and we know that you've helped us all find our way, not only as chair, as executive director, and as editor of Global Governance, and I know I hope that you'll continue to do so as past chair. So thank you so much, Tom. Yeah. Okay, well, while you're opening that, 
<laughs> so you can show the inertia. I'll, uh, I would like to make one announcement, and that is to let you know that each year the Friends of Acoons uh, held a competition for the best book uh, published in the, in the last year or so on the UN system. And this year, the winner of the book award is Benjamin Schiff. And he wrote a book called Building the International Criminal Court, a 2008 Cambridge University Press publication. So Benjamin is not here in Trinidad with us, but we will certainly uh, make sure that there is great recognition for his important work. There are typically many, many excellent submissions for this book award, and this year was no different. Uh, Melissa Labonte, where's Melissa? Melissa was one of the wonderful uh, people who agreed to read all of the books that were submitted, and I think she can attest to the fact that really there, it's always a tough choice. So we certainly congratulate uh, Benjamin Schiff for that work. While Tom is carefully dealing with the bubble wrap, I'll take advantage to say a I'm few really more things. <laughs> Just to, to, re to remind folks that um, we're going to take a quick coffee break and we'll be back here pretty quickly for a three-ish start with our uh, two ambassadors from New York talking about small states. Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> Terrific. Oh, look at that. Oh, that's great. Thank you once again. Oh, well, we should let people look at it. Yeah. <laughs> So we'll take a bit of a break, and uh, we'll reconvene here 3, 3.05 for the next plenary. Thank you. <laughs>